On a sunny day, the bikes are roaring, and the air is thick with anticipation as bikers make their way to a special field day. But for the police, this is the day they will catch the man who's about to destroy an entire motorcycle club. Or so they think. The club's members have already given the authorities a run for their money throughout the year. From the mildly mischievous to the downright criminal, and from small-time crimes to large-scale drug operations. But this field day is about to be a game-changer. The police are convinced that this event is a front for something bigger. Something that could tip the already teetering balance of control. Because this isn't your run-of-the-mill bike club. It is the Satan's Choice Motorcycle Club. It's the puppet master pulling the crime strings, and their leader and founder is holding all the cards. He is an enigmatic man who seems to have an uncanny ability to slip through the fingers of the law. His name is Bernie Gwinden, and his nickname, The Frog, fits him perfectly. Detectives have been hot on his trail, trying to catch him in the act, but it's like trying to grab a wet bar of soap. But it's like trying to grab a wet bar of soap. He hops from one place to another in record time, elusive and slippery. So as he gears up for the field day, the police see a golden opportunity to finally nab him. They deploy the anti-riot provincial police, a force of 100 strong armed men ready to disrupt the event. But they're in for a wild ride. As the anti-riot police move in, the atmosphere is charged with tension. But Gindon gives the instructions, and suddenly the police find themselves surrounded and overpowered. It's a spectacular failure. The police are forced to retreat to their cars as the bikers charge at them with a ferocity that catches everyone off guard. But who is this man, Bernie Gundon? How does he manage to strike fear not only into the hearts of his own club members, but also the entire police force? And how long can he keep dancing on the edge of the law before someone catches up with him? Well, that's the wild and extraordinary journey we're about to unravel. What unfolds is a tale of rebellion, evasion, and the clash between one man and the establishment. Young Bernie. On November 19, 1942, Bernie Gwinden is born to a French-Canadian couple in the bustling town of Hull, Quebec. But his entry into the world isn't the typical nursery rhyme story. His parents are a peculiar duo in their own right. His mother is a dropout with a flair for the unconventional. And his father is a former petty criminal from Buckingham turned bootlegger. Together, they are quite the odd pair and the Gindon family is constantly on the move, living in various locations in Quebec and Northern Ontario. In the Ontario of his childhood, bars and liquor stores are restricted to early closing hours, and Gindon's father sees this as a lucrative opportunity. The family house becomes the after-hours drinking hotspot for those thirsty for a drink past curfew, but they have to pay double the price for the booze, the Gindon family finds solace in the underground economy as the dad plays the role of a fence for corrupt Oshawa policemen looking to offload their ill-gotten gains. So young Bernie grows up in this whirlwind of crime and chaos, a real-life version of a crime novel. But the chaos doesn't stop at the city limits. They follow him home. His father has a peculiar sense of entertainment. He loves watching his sons duke it out. To keep him happy, Gwyndon constantly wrestles his brother, forging a lifelong sibling rivalry. But luckily, it's not the only thing Bernie gets from the fights. He develops a passion for boxing, and later, Canadian heavyweight champion George Chuvalo recognizes his potential and takes him under his wing for some time. As a teenager, life takes another turn. At 15, Gwyndon can't stand idly by as his father subjects his mother to abuse. Therefore, he defends his mother and turns the tables, giving his father a taste of his own medicine. The old man, realizing he couldn't mess with Gindon, promptly abandons the family. The void he leaves is filled by an unexpected hero, his mother's new boyfriend. And Gindon quickly creates a bond with the man so that he can let him ride his motorcycle. It doesn't take much convincing before his stepfather hands him the keys, and with that first ride, a love affair with motorcycles is born. It's a romance that would echo through the rest of his life. While working as an attendant at a gas station in Oshawa, Gwyndon uses his linguistic prowess in French to charm another French-Canadian girl, Suzanne Blay. He strikes up a connection with her, 
and they enter an on-off relationship that spans decades. Their love story provides just the right touch of romantic drama to Gindan's already colorful life. But the real love story for him isn't with Suzanne. It's with motorcycles and the unbridled freedom of the biker lifestyle. And he takes his first steps into this world where chaos is the norm, rules are optional, and the open road is the only constant. Will Gindan withstand the storms of the biker lifestyle? Can he find his own rhythm in the wild world of motorcycles? Or will it prove too turbulent for even him to handle? There's only one way to find out. Tasting the waters. Like any other youth, Gindan is dripping with machismo and a rebellious streak. And his main interest is the outlaw biker lifestyle. It's an interest awakened by his stepfather's motorcycle. All he wishes to do is hop onto the saddle of a motorcycle more often. So he saves up and gets himself one. He affectionately names it the Wild Thing. But the bike isn't inherently wild. It's him who injects the untamed spirit into it. And he has to find somewhere to direct his energy. So in 1959, at the tender age of 17, Bernie decides he can't keep idling on life's shoulder. It's time for a joyride into the heart of the biker world. He rolls up to the scene and joins the Golden Hawk Riders Outlaw Biker Club. And suddenly, his step has more bounce, and his rides garner even more envious stares. He is right where he wants to be, and life can't get any wilder, or so he thinks. Always the fashion-forward biker, Gindan always sports his helmet, not out of any safety concern or legal requirement. It's all about adding an aesthetic punch to his ride. And in the midst of all this leather-clad excitement, love strikes. His girlfriend, Blay, is expecting, and in 1961, he has to trade in his biker jacket for a wedding suit. But nothing can cramp his style, not even the vows, so Gindan remains as dedicated as ever to his beloved biker lifestyle. A lifestyle that hardly lacks feuds, because what's a biker tale without a good old-fashioned rivalry? In 1961, Gindan finds himself entangled in a tiff with none other than Harold Barnes. Barnes is the self-proclaimed Supreme Commander of the Toronto-based Black Diamond Riders. But Gwyndon, being himself, flat out refuses to address Barnes with the title. Barnes and his club have a reputation for forcing small clubs to disband. And in 1962, they do the same to the original Satan's Choice Club after relentless attacks. The Black Diamond Riders continue their rampage by assaulting the Golden Hawk Riders in the infamous Battle of Pebblestone, a brawl that could give any action movie a run for its money. During this battle, Gindan comes face to face with Barnes and they exchange heavy blows. As a result of the battle, the Golden Hawk Riders take a hit, but Gindan doesn't dwell on defeat. So he leaves the club with a plot of revenge against Barnes and his crew. He has a sharp brain, so he devises a master plan to humiliate the Black Diamond Riders. First on the checklist is getting the numbers. So Gindan brings several outlaw biker clubs together to form one. He understands that in the realm of street fights, strength lies in numbers, and he isn't all about pounding fists. He is also about strategic victories. In the outlaw biker code, cowardice is the cardinal sin, and he aims for something more satisfying than a mere brawl. He wants Barnes and his club members to retreat, and he executes the cunning plan flawlessly. Meanwhile, the Phantom Riders, Gwyndon's brainchild, emerge as a new club. The members are distinguished by their preference for British motorcycles, and the success of Gwyndon's strategic move against the Barnes attracts a slew of budding motorcycle clubs, especially those who have felt the menacing shadow of the Black Diamond Riders. Gwyndon is on top of the world, but is he satisfied with the success he's had so far in the biker world? Or will he aim for more? Satan's Choice The swinging 60s are an era of peace and love. But for Bernie Gwyndon, they're filled with a whole lot of rebellious biker action. As the years unfurl, he doesn't just ride through life. He orchestrates a symphony of chaos in the biker world. In 1965, Gwyndon, fueled by a potent mix of audacity and ambition, decides it's high time to make a statement. He conjures the Satan's Choice Outlaw Biker Club in Toronto, a coalition of his Phantom Riders of Oshawa and three other outlaw biker clubs. The new name is a strategic jab at the Black Diamond Riders, 
who had disbanded the original Satan's Choice Motorcycle Club. The club is young, with a formidable president, and he has the numbers to rival other outlaw motorcycle clubs. Upon its formation, it's officially the largest outlaw biker club in the Great White North. And Gindon is not just the president. He's the national president of this new roaring beast. The Black Diamond Riders are no longer a bother. Gindon uses his club's numbers to force them to retreat from every fight they try to pick. But he wants to finish them off. So, he takes it a step further. He rolls up to their clubhouse with his club members, challenging them to come out and face him. When he finally has them where he wants them, he dictates terms, forcing them to stop attacking smaller clubs. By 1968, the once mighty Black Diamond Riders Club has dwindled to a measly 15 members. Meanwhile, inside the Satan's Choice Motorcycle Club, Gwyndon is like the Yoda of the biker world. He is respected, revered, and maybe a touch feared. His self-discipline and athleticism are legendary, convincing smaller clubs to join his crusade. And outside the club, he's not just a biker. He's a folk hero for young Canadians. But at the time, Toronto is a cool, safe, and prosperous city. And not many people are thrilled with Gindon's brand of excitement. The authorities, always keen on keeping things prim and proper, disapprove of his escapades. So the club starts peacefully before dipping its toes into petty crimes, brawls, and a touch of illegal gun ownership and marijuana dealings. They're a recipe for trouble, and the police know it. And in late 1966, Gwyndon is put under heavy surveillance. A police cruiser is always parked outside his Oshawa home, interrogating anyone daring to enter or exit. Despite the love and support that Gwyndon and the club members receive from the public, the authorities are not ones to be swayed by public opinion. So in 1967, they beef up their surveillance of the club's activities, including field days. The anti-riot police, with dreams of disrupting a Satan's Choice field day, find themselves facing bikers twice their number. It's a horrific failure, but the police don't give up. They linger in the shadows, waiting for Gindon to make a wrong move. But Gindon can feel them breathing down his neck. So he continues to run things his way, only more cautious not to attract any attention. But while he's not getting the attention of the police, he grabs the attention of another club across the border. The American Hells Angels come knocking, suggesting a union of forces. But Gindon, fiercely Canadian and uninterested in American influence, waves off the offer. He has his own brand of chaos to manage, and he keeps steering the Satan's Choice ship through the turbulent waters of biker life, with the authorities still on his tail. He's no stranger to evading the law, but how long can he dance on the edge before the authorities make their move? How long until he slips up or fails to cover his trail? To prison and back, and back again. Life is humming along for Gindon and his crew. The bikes are revving and the road ahead looks smoother. But then, in October 1968, Gwyndon gets hit with a bombshell, a charge of the heaviest kind. The alleged rape of a minor in Ottawa, but ever the charmer, he insists that he thought the girl was the legal age of 18. The trial in 1969 unveils a gripping drama with the girl narrating a different tale. A tale in which she is held against her will for three days, victimized by five men, Gindon included. And on May 15, 1969, Gindon is dealt a hefty blow. He is convicted of sexual assault and slapped with a five-year sentence. But he holds his ground and believes that he's been framed. There are no witnesses, and the trial transcripts mysteriously disappear. Bernie finds himself in the illustrious Kingston Penitentiary, a maximum security fortress where even small talk between inmates is a crime, unless a guard's on the scene. Here, everyone knows Gindon's crime, so the odds are stacked against him, but he doesn't give up trying to convince everyone. It's a tough crowd, and he is sometimes on the receiving end of a less than warm welcome. But he does what he does best, convince most of the inmates that he's not the villain in this story. He keeps his discipline and fast forward to January 1971, and Gindon tastes freedom again, released on parole. He's eager to stay out of trouble, so he moves to Thunder Bay, where he restarts his boxing career, another thing he excels at. Unfortunately, the dream of, of representing Canada in the Olympics is impossible thanks to his criminal record. 
And in no time, Gindan's back in cuffs for violating parole rules and hanging out with his Satan's Choice pals. He is distraught by the strict parole rules. Therefore, even when parole beckons later on, Gwyndon, ever the rebel, waves it off because he's got a circle of criminal friends. Being on parole means keeping a safe distance from the squad, something he can't. After serving his full sentence, Gwyndon is back in the wild motorcycle world, reclaiming his national president throne from Garnet McEwen, who's been holding down the fort. He steps back into the clubhouse he never left, but things have changed. The club is now deep in the drug game, selling and manufacturing hard drugs. And Gendon, looking to keep things on the down low, strikes a deal with the American Outlaws Motorcycle Club to be the drug distributor. But that's not what McEwen hopes to achieve. He wants to cozy up with the Outlaws and adopt their American Outlaw values. Gendon shuts him down, but McEwen has plans. A coalition between Satan's Choice and the Outlaws is on his mind and he's willing to do whatever it takes. He's also moonlighting as a police informer, and he uses this connection to get rid of Gindan. While visiting Oba Lake Lodge in August 1975, Gwyndon is arrested by undercover detectives with a stash of PCP tablets worth six million Canadian dollars. The news spreads like wildfire, and the club is left in limbo. Gindan's influence on the club's affairs has kept the club afloat since he formed it. He's been the glue holding the Satan's Choice Motorcycle Club together. And with him in jail again, the road ahead is foggy for the remaining members of the club. Can the members weather the storm without their legendary leader? Only time will tell. Light burns out. August 6th, 1975 a day that would go down in biker history. Undercover officers swoop down on a snack bar at the Oba Lake Lodge, and there in the clutches of the law is Gindan. It's a deja vu moment for him, but this time he's caught red-handed with PCP tablets worth millions and the equipment to make them. This time he gets a hefty 17 year sentence and the club left without its charismatic leader is like a ship without a captain. Chaos ensues, members scatter, and what was once the second largest motorcycle club in the world becomes a mere shadow of its former self. While behind bars, Gindan gets wind that the mastermind behind his second arrest is none other than McEwen. He's the puppeteer pulling the strings for his own presidential ambitions, and he has already started patching some Satan's Choice chapters with the outlaws. Infuriated, Gindan puts a bounty of $10,000 on his head. The next 10 years are like a wild ride and the club is desperately trying to keep its engine running. But in 1984, Gwyndon is released on parole, and he dives straight back into the biker mayhem. He tries to find a job and live a normal life, but the biker lifestyle is tattooed on his soul. However, the club will never be the same. Zooming through the 90s, offers come knocking at Gwyndon's door. The Hells Angels want to patch up with Satan's choice, but Gwyndon, fiercely patriotic, wants his club to remain Canadian. In 1996, he throws in the towel, officially retiring as president of the club to savor family time. He still remains a member of the Oshawa chapter. And in 2000, under a different leadership, Satan's Choice joins forces with the Hells Angels. It's a strategic move to shield the remaining members from attacks, as the once formidable club is now weak. From there, he lays low until 2006, when he decides to hang up his biker boots. Bernie, the frog Gindan, rides off into the sunset, having built a motorcycle empire from the ground up. Satan's Choice, once the second largest motorcycle club in the world, is his legacy, even after merging with the Hells Angels. And what is a tale of rebellion, camaraderie, and a wild spirit navigating the treacherous twists and turns of the open road comes to a quiet and humble end.